And so I'd like to properly welcome you all to an audience with the president. If it's your first time, you're very welcome. And it's nice to see as well so many people joining us once more again. So my first job will be to hand over to the president of this British National Union, Minister David Bruton, who will introduce this session and his guests. So over to you, David. Thanks, Alv, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight, uh, we are going to have a slightly different night. A few weeks ago, we did a session that was dedicated to mediumship. And tonight's subject, although it's mediumship, it's just another aspect of mediumship. And I think it's fair to say that we've got two of the best exponents in the UK with us this evening. No pressure, ladies. Um, <laughs> But uh, I've, having known them for many years and watched them work on many, many occasions, uh, I know that we're in for a brilliant night. So let's introduce um, the people that we've, we've got with us on the panel tonight. The subject, of course, is spirit art, and that is also going to include orographs. And if nobody has actually ever seen a spirit art demonstration, um, it can be quite amazing because it's producing something that oftentimes can be corroborated through photographs of a loved one. And it just makes the information that the medium gives through the normal mental mediumship so much more powerful when you actually get a picture of the person that is relaying that information. So I'd like first to introduce Stella Upton, who is an officiant of the Spiritualist National Union. Although Stella has been aware of the spirit world since childhood, she actually took her first service back in 1990 and became a college tutor in 1999. Since then, she has been demonstrating her mediumship on a regular basis, along with doing many private sittings for survival evidence and also personal assessment. A more recent development for Stella was the painting of orographs. Along with teaching at the Arthur Finlay College, Stella has also been working with groups of students throughout the United Kingdom and abroad. The subjects she teaches include relaxation, meditation, awareness, colour, spirit art, <laughs> uh, paranormal phenomena and evidential Yay. mediumship. So Stella, welcome and thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure. Um, the, Second lady on our panel this evening is uh, Sue Wood. Uh, Sue has been a tutor at the Arthur Finlay College for more than 20 years. She <laughs> tells me she began when she was 15, and I've looked very many times. Um, she was aware of spontaneous spirit contact since early childhood. Uh, she began her long love affair with the Arthur Finlay College as a student back in 1980. Uh, she learned from the very best teachers to develop her own natural mediumistic abilities. When in 1991, the spirit world first inspired Sue to draw their portraits, it actually opened up a whole new career for her. Her background is in social work and counselling, and her spiritual art gifts were unfolding very quickly and she began serving churches the length and breadth of the country in 1993 and was invited to work as a tutor at the Arthur Finlay College. Since then, Sue has worked in many countries, teaching and demonstrating mediumship and spirit art and working with the Aura Camera in, and the countries she's been to, USA, Canada, many parts of Europe. Who specializes in helping students to build self-confidence and she loves to see a student blossom on their pathway. So welcome Sue and thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you David. So I'm going to uh, begin as we always do by just asking a few introductory questions which perhaps we have people in the audience tonight that I've never seen a spirit art demonstration um, and don't know how it works. So can I ask Sue, if I may, first and foremost, um, how do you set about, Sue, drawing a portrait? 
Okay, uh, when I first began to draw, it was very spontaneous. I was seeing many, many faces from spirit. Uh, as you said, I'd already been aware of spirit before, but this time I knew I had to draw them. Um, it's changed a little bit over the last 27 years. Uh, but now I find that I'm connecting to the spirit world by becoming very aware of my own energy, lifting my energy, uh, just to sense who is wanting to come through. And usually what I'm aware of, first of all, are the eyes. You know, they say that the eyes are the windows of the soul. And it's as though people can most express themselves and how they looked in the physical world by showing their eyes most strongly. Uh, and then gradually the, the nose, the, the mouth. Sometimes, and sometimes the, the shape of the face, um, most of us in our life, our face shape has changed. So I don't always get that exactly right. They may show themselves a little bit younger than you remember. Um, and often the hairstyle, I have to guess or imagine a hairstyle. But then when I think about my boys over the years, I would not know what hairstyle to produce if I was coming in from spirit, because I've been all colours, all length, short, very short, very long, and all sorts of colours. So I suppose our hair changes too. Okay, that, that's brilliant. So, so um, do you get a, a mental impression or, or do you just feel, does the picture just appear on the paper as if by nothing? <laughs> Is there any other control or, or, or what? I just want to try and understand how it yes. works with you. Well, initially, I would actually see the spirit uh, person. Um, a, a lady or a gentleman, a child, and I would feel um, something about the relationship of who it is that, that they are uh, wanting to connect to, and I would see them. And because my work was almost always in a church or at the college uh, from the early days, then I would uh, feel drawn to the person that I knew they were wanting to connect to. And I would often see them almost standing there beside their loved one. Who, who would be in the room. Um, it didn't stay quite as, as easy as that. So now, quite often I, I will see them, but often more mentally, and sometimes I don't see them at all, but I feel them, I sense how they look, and I just have to have a go and draw them. It doesn't seem to make much difference to the outcome, whether I'm seeing or sensing. The only thing about when I have seen the, the, the person coming in from spirit, Usually then I can get their likeness. Sometimes if I'm sensing, two or three of your relatives may be coming in on the same link. So I may well have the top half of mum with, with dad's uh, chin or hairstyle or something like that. But, so I like to be able to see, but sometimes I'm clairsentient, not always clairvoyant. Depends upon the energy of the person coming in from spirit as much as from my energy, I think. Okay, and I know you've been asked this question a thousand times before, but are you a good artist? Could you draw before you actually started working in this way? <laughs> I had not drawn at all. I've never had, even now, I've never had a class where I've learned how to draw. It came purely from spirit, and um, you know, in a way, that was that was quite an achievement. But I guess they understood that for me to believe it. Uh, it needed to be something that I could not personally do. Now, of course, I could. Now I could draw because I've been doing it constantly for 27, 28 years. Yes. Oh, that's, that, that's brilliant. Amazing. And do the spirit world as a whole make good sitters or are some better than others? Oh, some are better than others. I had a wonderful gentleman from uh, Liverpool once. Uh, two, two ladies desperately wanted a sitting with me and they were sisters and I had no sittings left but I squeezed them one appointment in and their dad came through and I was so happy that he did. He told me the names of the other four children back home and he gave me so much information about his life as a bus driver in Liverpool. He was a <laughs> wonderful sitter. Oh, brilliant. That's, that's brilliant. Now I know when I've seen you work pu uh, publicly on many occasions um, you, you sometimes work with another medium and the medium provides a lot of the evidence what, which allows you to concentrate on the drawing, of course. Um, 
do you find you can work with any medium or are there only particular certain particular mediums that you like <laughs> i'll be careful now that's not <laughs> a question isn't it <laughs> uh, no quite quite frankly i mean the the mediums that I have worked with have usually all been Arthur Finley tutors. So yeah. I've only really had the offers from the very best, yeah. but mainly. Um, but uh, no, we've, we've always been able to blend. Some, with some it's a little bit different. I remember once working with Glyn Edwards and I almost needn't to have been there. <laughs> he gave so much information. I forgot I was drawing. But apart from that, no, I, I can work with him ever. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. So we're going to come back to you in a few moments. I'd like to go to Stella. And Stella, for the audience that have never seen an orograph or don't know what an orograph is, can you explain a little bit about an orograph and maybe a little bit about the history of orographs within spiritualism? Okay, I can do that, yes. I've got some samples here as well. Well, I was very inspired when I first went to the college in the 1980s by a gentleman called Harold Sharp mm -hmm. and uh, I have one of his orographs here. Okay, so it's very unusual, very striking and I was very encouraged by my tutor at the time um, when I was in the, at the college and uh, I was already working with art, I was already an art teacher and so it just what made me want to draw them myself and with an awareness of colour and symbols. I just was so inspired uh, with this gentleman. But for myself, um, as I got more inspired to draw and to work with orographs, in the beginning I was very surprised that when I did orographs with somebody sat in front of me, it was for them. Um, and I was very surprised in the very beginning that as I started to read the orograph and bring forward the colours and the symbols within it, that it made perfect sense to them. And so really I've just gone from there. Uh, and believe me, the more you work with colour, the more you want to work with colour and you, you can bring more into it. Now I don't only bring colour and symbols into it, I also bring numerology into it. And you get such a lot of information in a picture. And if we just show it by contrast, uh, you don't need to be able to draw, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, you really don't. Uh, that's uh, one of mine. And I can see that you can't draw, Stella. That's, that, beautiful. that's, right. that's absolutely beautiful. <laughs> And um, there's another one. I'm showing you because they're very different, you know. Wow. Mm. So um, you don't need to be able to draw. Anyone can draw an orograph, believe me, you can. I just had an artistic background when I came into this, so I was incredibly lucky with that. Um, but it's just a great joy, and it's a lovely way to work uh, with the intuitive self. So if I came to you to have my orograph. Uh, drawn, um, what would you be telling me? Well, first of all, I start with a blank piece of paper, and sometimes I can see images on the paper as I tune into the person before me, colours certainly. I'd be telling you about your spiritual potential first and foremost, maybe things that have happened in the past because it's a private sitting, so personal things may come forward. Very occasionally, I do get a spirit contact within that now. Didn't used to in the beginning, but as I got over the years and practiced over the years, I sometimes do get a spirit contact in there as well. Sometimes even drawing grandmother's house or garden or whatever. So it's evidential in that way in these days. I'd be telling you um, maybe about some things that have happened in your past, not dwelling on it, just you know, making um, an acknowledgement of it and telling you the potential that you have to take forward. And it makes no difference whether you've already been working upon your spiritual pathway or not. Does that answer your question, David? That's, that, that, that's absolutely brilliant. So is this uh, psychic, spiritual or a, mis a mixture of the both? Um, as orographs are predominantly psychic. It's using the intuitive self uh, and that's a, a starting place. It was years and years of practicing with this faculty before I started to get spirit communication. But you have to keep in mind that I was already 
uh, a medium by then and so working with it on a regular basis and the two just happened to come together and when they do that I call them spirit pictures because it's no longer just looking at the aura hence the name orograph. Okay that's fine and do you find that it complements your mediumis mediumistic work? Absolutely I always tell people you know when you work with colour it really enhances your ability with clairvoyance. Sometimes you can get lost in the colours. It's the most wonderful feeling. I know some people will agree with me who also work with orographs, but it really enhances uh, your powers, your, your clairvoyance, simply because you're working with colours. Then you start to see colours around people. Then you start to be aware of colours through the spirit world. Uh, and so it really is good to keep on working in this way. Okay, that's, that, that's brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, can we now open the, uh, the floor to anyone that would like to ask some questions? Uh, I've got a couple of subjects I can talk about if, uh, if we've got <laughs> nobody yet wants to ask questions. Um, but uh, Al, do we have, do we have anybody? Uh, we don't have any questions yet, so if I can, I think everybody's just absorbed listening <laughs> into that. Uh, yeah, here they come. I knew it. I knew it. Um, the line bird has raised up. Yeah, so uh, while I'm going to invite Elaine in in a moment, uh, can I ask the rest of you to start thinking of any comments you want to make or anything that you'd like to ask? So they're coming through now. So Elaine, would you like to unmute your microphone and come in and ask your question, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, this is a question for Sue. Um, I have been working as a medium for uh, about 15, 19 years on the platform. Um, but I've always loved art and have recently started to try to do spirit art. Has she got any pointers to help me with my development as a spirit artist, please? Uh, well, yes, in as much as practice, 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 make sure that you are um, particularly practicing uh, with faces that are different to, to the last few you've drawn because I find students very often will be drawing a basic face and that is one that then just gets changed a little bit while they're working. Now the spirit world have very willing people there who will come as models for you. Mm. So that does that, yeah. That it, you know, it doesn't mean that you haven't got someone from spirit, um, but these are really for your own practice, and they are for you to keep. They're not they're not ones that you would put on Facebook to say, does anybody recognise this? It's it's a someone from the spirit world as a model to give you that practice that you need and to inspire you in different ways. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Keep up the good work. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Elaine. That was a, a great question, and I think uh, one that that most of us here will be interested in about you know advancing that aspect of mediumship. So I'm going to ask a question from the chat box now from Lorna, uh, and Lorna asks our panelists: Are there any courses that you uh, advise that someone could start with? So I guess we're looking at the foundations of this aspect of mediumship. Have you got any thoughts? On that? Yes, there are various courses at the Arthur Finley College. Um, of course, at the moment, uh, we're not able to take students right now because of the lockdown and the situation, but that is being worked upon. And certainly over the next few weeks, we're hoping to be able to bring you news of the possibility of courses perhaps with few students at a time that we can offer again art and mediumship together. Both Stella and myself often work together on courses. Um, so just keep looking out for that. At the moment, um, you may find uh, some people may be work offering teaching online. I'm not, I don't feel technically capable just yet to do that, but just keep watching and I'm sure you'll find there's a lot of help going to be available to you, certainly by September. Okay, Stella, have you got anything you'd like to add to that? Um, well, Sue uh, mentioned most of the things I was going to talk about. However, Sue and me do have a course together in November, I think it is on the December, uh, or I think it one goes into from the November to December. It's a trans art course. Um, so it doesn't only cater for those people who are wanting to work with trans, there's also will be a group 
for people yeah. who maybe haven't experienced uh, art before. Um, but other than that, I only can repeat what Sue has said. Okay. Uh, but we're also offering at the Barbinell Centre, of course, and we're hoping that some of those are going to go ahead. I have got courses there planned uh, in September and October. So just keep looking out. You'll, fi you'll find as soon as we can get back together again, we will. And I think it's worth noting at this point that um, Barbinell Centre, we hope, will be open at the beginning of July. Yes. It's going to take the college longer because of the nature of the business of the college. Um, and I have no firm date yet for when we will open. Um, but uh, certainly Barbinell plans to be open uh, beginning of July and we hope to get the courses up and running as soon as we can. So mm. thank mm. you for that. Al, do you have another question? Thank you. And yeah, good advice there and, and good to know that uh, there is established teaching for this type of mediumship. So there are actually ways in for people. So thanks for asking that question, Lorna. I'm going to invite Julie now, who's got a hand up, if she would like to unmute her microphone and come in and ask your question or make a comment. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, it's to the floor, really. So the the concept of um, automatic writing then, is that on the same par, on the same wavelength as psychic art, or does that come on in a different way? Stella, would you like to start with that? Um, from my point of view, automatic writing is not really something that I would do on, on an art course, maybe an experimental mediumship course. Um, so if you're looking at uh, learning about that, maybe you can find something online. There's a lot of things online about that, actually. Or um, no, no, learn it. I just want to find the same powers. Does it come through the same channel as psychic art? Uh, in my mind, no. It's a, it's a quick answer. So, um, I agree with Stella. It, it can be very interesting and some lovely philosophy can come through with writing, but it isn't actually the same as art. Okay. There we are. So thank you for asking that, uh, Julie. Uh, it's really interesting to investigate how the different kinds of mediumship have connections and to draw lines between them all to, to map it all out. So that helps us a little bit there. Brilliant. Are there any more questions from the chat room or, or in, in the participants box? Anyone would like to come forward and ask a question? Mike, I'm going to ask you to unmute your microphone and pop in and ask your question. Go ahead, Mike. Hi, good evening, everybody. My, my, my question is basically a simple one. Um, if I wanted to have an orograph reading, where would I find on the web or wherever a medium that has the orograph capability that I could get in touch with. Uh, let me answer you, Mike, if I may. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I am an orograph medium. Uh, you can either approach the college, who can approach me, and I will happily do an orograph sitting for you via the college, of course, via Zoom. Mm -hmm. Or you can contact my my own website, um, okay. Stella Upton, into uh, Google then that should find me. However, I am doing sittings via the college at the moment. So your first call, of course, is the college. Okay, Stella, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And we have some more questions coming in from the chat box now, which I'm going to relay. Um, let's see, where shall we start? Oh, this is a good question. If someone is a perfectionist with their artwork, Asked Jenny, do you think that's going to hold them back with their spirit art? Would you like to go first, sir? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I believe it probably would. You have to, one, once you're focusing upon your ability or upon how you are doing, you're becoming a spectator rather than allowing the mediumship to flow. So, um, very often I've completed a drawing. When I look at it, I'm not very happy with it. But usually the recipient says that's exactly like him or her. Um, so 
it's, it's okay as long as you don't allow it to come in while you're working. Really, I, I <laughs> forgive me for saying this, but I always say to my students, um, when you're switching into the mind or, or considering or looking or thinking, then you're losing your uh, right brain activity, which is the creating and, and expressing spirit. Um, and I always say the time for the post-mortem is when the body is dead. <laughs> so when you finish the drawing and put your pencil down, then you can have a look to see how could I have done that better? Was it okay? Where did I go wrong? Uh, but not at the time. <laughs> And if I may also just come in here uh, in respect of orographs, I can't tell you, sometimes I get orographs via my website, which uh, come in, I get an email to say that, uh, that the person wants an orograph and they send me a picture. That's all I ask for is just a photograph. Well, I can spend four or five days doing this orograph because I'm such a perfectionist. I can't tell you how many I rip up sometimes half a pad's worth before I'm satisfied with something. And I think artists are all like that. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, Al, thanks. Before, you go, before you go on with the box, can I just ask Sue a question, please? Um, go for it. Sue, um, have you ever started a drawing and realising you're actually drawing somebody who is quite famous? Has that ever happened? Yes. <laughs> it might have done. <laughs> <laughs> but not famous as in Elvis or anybody like that. Okay. But somebody right. somebody who was um, a very, very well known medium came through to me a few years ago at the Arthur Finley College and I really didn't want to draw her. Okay. So you knew you knew who she was. Did you draw her? Well, I was working with Janet Parker who brought the mediumship through. Yes. That did not sound like the lady I thought I was drawing. So I went ahead with it and drew it. Yes. And in fact, it was the person I was aware of. But unbeknownst to us, her son was in the audience and he, he had terminal cancer at the time. And he really needed that contact from his mum. So if I had not drawn that, I would have been doing a great disservice to the spirit world. Um, so, yes, fortunately, Spirit found a way round my objection to drawing <laughs> someone on you. I think there's a lesson there for all of us mediums, oh. you know. Uh, sometimes we just be, become aware of someone and we just have to go with it, don't we? So, yeah, yes. that's, yeah. that, that's brilliant. Absolutely great. Oh. Brilliant. Okay, Al, would you like to go back to the question? Absolutely. We, we've got a few questions yet in the chat box, but I'm going to come back into the room. And I'm going to invite Denise to step forward and ask your question. Welcome, Denise. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask Sue, if I may, um, <clears throat> when you start to draw and you said that you uh, sort of focus on the eyes or that's where spirit takes you to on the paper, is it a communication that you've got before you put uh, pen to paper? Or is it while you're drawing the picture builds and the communication? Thank you. Um, I, I'm usually aware that, so it, I'm, I'm usually aware that, I'm a, that there's a gentleman or a lady or whoever it is, and I begin with the eyes, but then the personality and everything else comes through as I'm working. So I get yeah. information as, as I actually create the face. Yeah. And you did answer my, well, a question that I had in my mind with the last uh, lady, um, when you said about if you're a perfectionist, um, I had at one time drawn uh, somebody on the paper and one eye was definitely higher than the other. And immediately I thought, oh my goodness me, am I going to have to throw this one away? And the recipient said, exactly, that's how my mother was. She had one eye higher than the other. And to me, it saved my confidence. It's, it's great proof, isn't it, when that happens? I yeah. know in the early days I used to try to correct the face a little bit better. Maybe I've made the ears stick out too much so I'd make them a bit prettier. And the, the, the daughter or the son would say, well, yes, except her ears stick out more. 
<laughs> so I've learned not to do that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sue. Brilliant. Thank you for that question and uh, a lesson to us all there. And if we had a pound for every time we've heard, give what you get, I think we'd all be a little bit richer, <laughs> wouldn't we? <laughs> okay. And I think following on from that question, we have a question in the chat box, uh, which talk from, from Helena, who, who talks about the eyes in a drawing. And Helena asked, do have either of you ever noticed when you're drawing that the eyes come alive as, as almost as if they're watching you because it's I think that there is that extra energy and spirit art that is sometimes a is that something that you felt either of you How well for me <laughs> for me almost always um you know in fact I actually find the person from the spirit is showing themselves almost as if they're going to have a passport photograph taken and I keep smiling hoping that they'll smile back and sometimes they do but yet the eyes do suddenly come alive as I draw. Brilliant. Brilliant. It's amazing isn't it? It, re it reminds me of the the paintings by the Bang sisters and how they have oh. that life of their own. Um, we have a question about oil graphs now and Ella asks and I, I guess this is to you Stella, uh, do oil graphs have to be artistic uh, because Ella says some that uh, she's seen have, have been quite simple drawings and just to uh, expand on that there is uh, another question uh, that, that links very strongly to that. Uh, and uh, Jenny is asking, is it possible to use uh, reference photos when you're drawing? So, for example, if you feel there should be a specific bird or a flower in there, is it OK to look at photos to make the orograph? Or will that cause you to lose the question, uh, lose, lose the connection? Sorry. OK, I, I think it depends if you if you have the person in front of you or, or not or if you if somebody sent you a picture and you're doing it in your own home to post to them if you are doing it in your own home to, to post to them and you're just learning your trade how to draw shapes and things i don't see what's wrong with tracing things out of magazines or copying things that's the way we learn that's the way how we teach ourselves to draw is simply by doing that so no that's not wrong at all you're teaching yourself how to draw um, I, I can't remember what the first one was now. Oh yes, it, drawings, orographs don't need to be complicated. You find that as, as the years go by, you get more and more complicated. I start to add in things like now I add in basic numerology. So uh, there's more in an orograph with me now. However, when we are just beginning this uh, art, it doesn't matter if you just want to draw one symbol, it might simply just be a feather or a candle. It might even be just a circular shape with different colored squares. It can be anything because the most important thing is really to have an accurate reading with how you feel about the shapes and the colors that are there. So it, it doesn't matter. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. So do we... Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm no, go for it, David. All right, that's fine. Sue, can I ask you, um, who who were your heroes in the movement who did you uh, aspire to when you were beginning to who did you want to be like or or who who really inspired you <laughs> you know if i could have chosen any gift at all i wanted to be like jill harland i wanted to sing i didn't want to draw yeah, well, well, <laughs> i would love to be a singer the emotion she used to bring into her, her oh, true, work. Very true. Um, but as far as art was concerned, of course, the world famous artist at that time, um, I booked on a course with Coral Polge, who was a tutor at the college and a wonderful artist. Yes, amazing, wonderful. Mm. You, you, you set your standards high from the beginning. And can I, <laughs> can, I, can I put the same question to Stella? you know thinking back to when you began Stella um who, who really inspired you um in your early investigations into spiritualism well certainly with the art it was definitely Harold Sharp 
uh, and I was just uh, in awe of him and his work. I always imagined one day I'd be doing autographs very much like him, and I was a bit disappointed when it never happens. <laughs> um, from my mediumship point of view, I was very inspired with Mavis. She was teaching when I went to the college in the 1980s. Uh, very inspired with her and how she put over the information and everything and was very encouraging. So, um, who else? Um, Leonard Young, um, he really um, pushed me on in the art field as well, encouraged me. And so there's, actually there's quite a few people when I think about it. So I'm going to ask you one more question, Stella. Um, yeah. what, um, what information, what, what advice would you give to your younger self now? You've, you've spent these years, 30, 30 odd years nearly, uh, yeah. in this field. Um, what advice would you give your younger self today? Stop questioning your own ability and let the spirit work guide you. <laughs> oh, and we can all take that one, can't we? Absolutely, I can, I can understand <laughs> that. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Al, do you have any more questions? Yes, I do. Uh, so we have another question from the chat room. And, and uh, Helena asks, would you consider that uh, orographs are similar to the perhaps symbolism that we might find in other things such as, as tarot cards and, and how do they relate to the individual? And I, and I guess we can start by asking that to Stella, but it would be interesting to ask Sue as well, does she ever uh, find symbols coming through in her work? But we'll, we'll start with Stella. Yeah. Well, I actually started with tarot cards in my teenage years. I entertained my friends doing them tarot readings. And the symbols for me are, are very much the same. You read the symbol, it's how you interpret it. will be the same whether it's a tarot card or an orograph. Um, so for me, it's exactly the same. How about you, Sue? Yeah. Yes, for me, uh, symbols are a big part of our work. Um, even if I'm, I'm aware of a person from Spirit and I'm drawing their portrait, they will often also show me a symbol, which is, is part of the message or what I need to say to the recipient. So symbols are a big part. And, and of course, as Stella said earlier, colour and symbology, really I call that the language of Spirit because it's an easy way for them to, to communicate with us it, it, as long as we know how to interpret it. Mm. Thanks, Sue. And uh, following on from that, we have a question from Alison, who asks, is an orograph a reading of someone's auric field? So different colours coming from the person's own aura, for example. Yes. <laughs> Jordan, great, you asked the question. <laughs> There's your answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stella. So do we have any more questions either from the room or from the chat box? Because if we don't, I'm going to uh, leap in with something that I've been wanting to ask. But I wonder if both of you could uh, talk a little bit more about the importance of colour in mediumship, because obviously in, in orographs and, and in the spirit art as well, colour, and as Sue's just said, ha has a lot of meaning. But could you talk a little bit about, about the importance of colour in your mediumship? Certainly, I believe that um, I think all development should start in the psychic anyway. It normally does, not with everyone, but most people do. And so learning about colour will empower you for sure. And, and as you go forward with that, that connection within yourself to read people around you, uh, then it's natural progression that the next step for that will be connected to the spirit world, to read, uh, to connect with them. It's telepathy just the same, using the same faculty there, telepathy, to bring forward information in, of an evidential kind. Colour is very useful um, in that way uh, from my point of view, because um, you may be aware of colour, colour with the spirit world, and it may be colour of a uniform or a job they used to do, um, maybe colour of hair if it's pertinent to the information that you're giving. Um, so it, it really can't be underestimated. The thing that I, I have to say to you that we all use colour in a different way. 
And so just let it lead you in your own mediumship. And even in healing mediumship, colour is very important as well, because you, if you're clairvoyant, then you're going to see colours around people, certainly with certain conditions. Um, so I would say it's a very good thing to unfold. Thank you. And how about you, Sue? How is colour important to you? It's very important. In the year 2000, I, I really was not very well. And I had to be on medication for about six months that slowed my energies right down. And that was the time when I actually began to study uh, quite deeply uh, working with the aura and in fact bought an aura camera. Now, I don't need an aura camera because I can actually see the aura, but people like to have a photograph of their own colours, and that's something the aura camera can produce for you. You see, it's not just the colours around the person. Um, these colours are actually electromagnetic energies, which are a reflection of your soul. And so the colours in the aura and where it is in the aura uh, we'll have an entirely different interpretation, which I've loved spending the last 20 years studying quite deeply. So the energies on this side, for instance, uh, the energies there will connect to what, what vibration is coming in around you now. And if we go just a little bit higher, this will tell me something about relationships in your life. So the colours would be interpreted quite differently, um, even if the colour there and the colour there was the same colour, it would have an entirely different meaning according to where it is in the aura. And I find when spirit come in, they often will oblige me by putting colours around themselves to give me other added information because they know I will work that way and understand what they're trying to say. So it's very important for me, colour. Can I, Thank you, can Thank I, you can I ask, um, Can I just ask both of you, um, have you ever and I, I think I know what the answer to this is, but I'm going to ask it all the same. Have you ever applied uh, colour and your um, your work with aura um, around healing? And have you actually watched the aura change as healing is delivered? Certainly, if I may come in with this. Um, I, You know, my, my husband works with healing, is a, a healing medium uh, for many, many years. And we used to sit on a regular basis. And of course, I, I, I've always chaperoned for him when a patient has come to the house. And over the years, I've watched him. And on several occasions, um, I remember seeing colours around him. We don't, obviously now it's in lockdown, so we can't work in this way um, at the moment. But I remember something very striking in one of these occasions. I was watching this lady, uh, who was a patient and, uh, and um, there were, I, I could see colours around the back of her head and her back and they were red colours and then when I looked at Stephen he had all green colours in front of him I'd never seen anything like that before I'd not particularly been interested in it before I have to admit to you I have been since that time and as the healing took place I could see Stephen's hand upon her back and the, both the colours came into the middle and then the red went to Stephen and the green went to her. So the colours had totally changed over, uh, which told me and showed me very clearly that something was taking place. That was just amazing and it sort of opened my eyes up to the possibility of co watching colours within healing and uh, now it happens a lot. So. Um, Yes, I have seen it on several occasions now. Have, have it, can I ask if either of you have ever been there when somebody has been taking their transition and if you, you've used your mediumistic faculties to watch the change in the energy as the spirit leaves the physical? I, I have been there when someone made their transition, but it was relative and I wasn't so much watching the energy of the aura but I certainly saw the the energies quietening and, and becoming uh, really with uh, drawing inwardly yes. the, the colors went from around the body into the body and I was aware of spirit leaving the body uh, but but I can't say I noticed how the aura then had changed afterwards because I was quite emotional it's understandable yes yes okay. mm. 
So when, my, when my father passed, I was there when my father passed, and um, I was aware all of a sudden as his breathing slowed down of this yellow light uh, around him. And it actually spread out from him around the room uh, and then uh, his breathing stopped. So, and I could see very clearly that the spirit was moving on in the direction where the light was shining. So that was a, a profound experience again uh, in that, but I've never witnessed anything else of that nature. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, David, may I, may I just um, speak to, to the question about seeing colour and, and changes in healing? Yeah, cool. uh, when I'm working at the college on courses, with my aura camera usually is there as well, we've often done experiments where we get students to focus healing energies on somebody that needs healing. And we take aura photographs before, and then when the group have sent the healing energies to that person, the aura brightens terribly, uh, really, really noticeably changes, sometimes changing colour too. And I always have to say, if I'm working on the week when Stephen, uh, uh, who's a wonderful healer, as Stella said, is at the college, I have to say that if they're having a sitting with Stephen and they're having an aura photograph with me, it's important they have the aura photograph taken first because otherwise their aura photograph is just going to show a complete uniform blended orange everywhere because that will be there for two or three days after Stephen has healed them. That's amazing. That's, mm. good. That's it, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk within academia about needing evidence, obviously, of, of the effectiveness of healing. Um, and certainly we are required to be able to provide that as we push forward to work with various different NHS trusts. Um, so to have that kind of evidence and experience is, is amazing. And that's, that's, mm. that's brilliant to hear. Brilliant. Albert, do we have any more questions? Yeah, absolutely. So we have, um, I'm going to put two questions together because they're uh, about learning and practice really. Uh, so Jenny asks, are, are there any books or other resources that you recommend for learning more about spirit art? And, and Denise uh, also asks about what materials both of you prefer to use when you're doing a den. So uh, what are your responses to that? It would be interesting to find out. Would you like to go first, Sue? Okay. If I'm working uh, in a demonstration situation, drawing portraits, then I want for everybody to be able to see the picture being drawn. So I will often work on um, either an overhead projection acetate using an overhead projector pen, so they can see the eyes, they see the nose, they see every aspect being drawn. And that's when they usually say, oh, that's when the face became alive, the eyes began to look alive, uh, halfway through a drawing. But uh, if I'm doing, when I was doing private one-to-one -one sittings many years ago, I like to work with pastels. But if I'm working with colour and pastels to do an autograph, uh, to, sorry, to do a portrait, um, only the person one-to-one uh, -one would be able to really see that picture uh, being done. Uh, so I, I love to work with pencils. Um, and now, of course, I work mainly on, on a computer iPad with an iPad pencil where it works just as well and people can watch the faces actually being created and drawn on their um, on their computer. And with myself and orographs, my preferred way of working is with watercolour paint or, or crayons and just so happens, uh, don't, don't sponsor me by the way, but these are watercolour crayons and you can see that they're very well used. I'll just, okay, oh, you can't actually see anything. There you go. <laughs> Having the left right problem. Um, I like watercolour crayons because wherever I am in the world, I can just put them in a suitcase. You can see they don't take up any room at all. And you, what you do is you draw uh, your drawing, what you have to draw, and then you, you get a glass of water and a paintbrush and you just put, paint it on and it becomes a painting. It's an amazing um, thing to use because you put, put the crayon exactly where you need it. Uh, for paper, I use at least a 300 gram acid-free sheets. It's quite, it's a quite thick paper as you can see. And quite expensive. 
so look around a little bit and um, if you have anything of a thinner nature it bevels and then you get you know, a wavy picture which doesn't look good when you're you know presenting it to somebody so 300 grams 250 grams is okay uh, it'll do but 300 grams is the best weight that you can get okay the watercolor crayons uh, a good set of brushes all different sizes as you can see for back washers for details etc so get two or three brushes and the drawing pen so um that's um that's really all I can say to you is it's not a lot of equipment, um, but be sensible in your choices. Don't have anything of an inferior quality because it'll frustrate you. Fantastic advice. And I've just checked on the SNU website and in the shop, we do still have in stock uh, two volumes of the Harold Sharp uh, Orographs, fantastic mm. box with full colour orographs in there. And I, I think that's often a good starting point. Uh, do either you, Stella, or, or Sue, have any books or people to research that you would recommend to help people on their way in this? I'm supposed to be having a, an orograph book out next year sometime. I've been working on it now for two years uh, because I'm so busy. I don't very often spend as much time on it as I should do. But within that book um, will be uh, not just orographs, it'll be about the history of colour, Harold Sharp and also symbols and meaning different meanings of color around the world etc etc so it's an advertisement moment so get ready for next <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're, we're turning into a bit of a shopping channel at the moment <laughs> but exciting new direction <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> sue do you have any uh, people that you would recommend people look up or, or read about to to inspire them Oh, it's always good to read about other artists because there have been some amazing artists in the past. Um, we, we need to go back quite a long time to the Bang Sisters um, and, you know, it's, and, and the Campbell brothers. So these will tell you about things that were possible and that happened and, and people were working in wonderful ways with art. Cora Polge has her book called Living Images and um, uh, there, there's another book, oh dear, I've forgotten his name, Frank, um, the, the spirit artist, I can't think of his name, who also wrote a lovely book called Living Images, and they are all drawings, and these were done round about the, well, the war years, so around about the 1930s, 40s, and there were some amazing portraits done uh, by Frank, and I can't remember his name. That's, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that that's well worth looking at if you can still. And I do know that that was back in reprint because for a long time you couldn't get that book, and I, I had a very old original one. Um, so yeah, this is it. But you know, really, with portraits, it's about practical work. You've got, you've got to practice, practice, and it's not much good trying to copy anyone. You have to be able to. Build your own energy and it's important that you learn how to build your power because without that power you're just drawing. So it's about having the power that the spirit world can blend with you and show themselves to you in whatever way, whether it's through clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, so you can sense spirit if you're going to work with portraits. Fantastic. I think we've got time for one more question. And an interesting one asked here. Uh, to both of you, have you ever experimented using your non-dominant hand uh, as, as a way of finding out how uh, the level of spirit influence that is there? I can see Sue nodding, so we'll talk mm -hmm. to Sue. Um, working with spirit art for me, even in what we may think of as a fully mentally alert state, I still believe it is an altered state. To connect to spirit um, but I also work with altered states which might be described or understood a little bit more as being trance states and when I'm working in a trance state or a slightly deeper state then I work with two hands simultaneously so my left hand and my right hand are working independently of each other which I cannot possibly do when I'm fully alert in the alpha state 
Fantastic. From my point of view, I, I do experiment all the time uh, with my different hands. I haven't tried my feet yet. I don't <laughs> think I would like those images very much. Uh, but I, should, I think we should try everything. You know, you can go forward, you, you enhance your mediumship and whatever it is you're working with by practicing and trying different things. So we all need to experiment more, I think. Thank you, Stella. And, and a, a, I think a quick answer for this one from Charlie, who's asking, is it better to work with our earthly teachers or to ask the spirit world to help us? I think I know what the answer is going to be, but Stella. Um, I think it's always a good starting point if you work with your earthly teachers first. Um, and then as time goes on, and they're still just been talking about the states of trance, uh, that eventually you find yourself in when you work with something again and again and again. Uh, and then it would be lovely to just let the spirit world do the drawing. Uh, at least they will be able to draw a horse properly or a donkey or whatever it is that I find difficult to drawing. So it's always a, a godsend, a, a blessing when I look down and see something that I know I can't draw. So it's um, start with your earthly teachers and then move on over time. Uh, to the spirit teachers, like everything else that, however, we work. And Sue, I guess you'd say something different because you talked about not having drawn before you <laughs> began this journey. Well, that's right. I, I developed my mediumship and then I suddenly realised that's what spirit were trying to get me to do, was to draw. On that particular evening, all I had was lined paper like so, just normal paper and a biro. And I just began to draw that, e that particular evening. And the faces began to look human, uh, way beyond my ability to draw. And it was getting on quite late, almost midnight, and I didn't want to go to bed in case it stopped in the next morning, I couldn't do it. But in fact, it, it's, it's for me, I think, when you are ready, the teacher comes. So whether that's the teacher from spirit or whether it's earthly teachers, and as Stella said, you need both. Uh, most people would start with an earthly teacher. Most spirit artists, I mentioned the wonderful Coral Polge, she was a trained artist. Quite a few people who work with spirit art have trained in art first. Uh, for me, it, it worked the other way, but yeah. Uh, it's it's much better if you know how to draw. Uh, then it's a, a, I imagine it's an easier thing for spirit to inspire your mind to draw uh, the person that they're trying to to bring through to you. So both are important. Some great points there. The time is ticking away, so I'm going to hand back to David to close our time together. David. Well, in closing, I would like to extend my warmest and sincere thanks to Stella and to Sue. I think we've had a brilliant evening. We've had an insight into an aspect of mediumship that I'm sure many of us didn't fully understand. And now we have a greater understanding. And um, I can feel, you know, I'm sure I've got a set of paints somewhere, you know, and I, I have a go. <laughs> I'm not promising I'll produce anything, but I will certainly try. So thank you both. Uh, Sue and Stella, it, it's been a great evening and we've really enjoyed your company and you are leading us in to this interesting aspect of our mediumship experience. Thank you both. Um, just to, uh, as we, before we close, um, you know that over the last couple of weeks um, I've mentioned that we're going to take a break with uh, audience for the, with the president after next week's special. Um, and we've invited you to bring forward suggestions of what you would like next week. I'd like to thank everybody that's taken the time to send suggestions. We've got some quite interesting projects there that we're certainly going to try and uh, include in future uh, sessions. Um, I have to tell you that so far we have covered philosophy uh, that was at the beginning of our run and also we've focused a lot on religion and the different aspects of the religion of spiritualism so the one subject that we haven't covered so far which is considered to be one of the pillars of spiritualism is of course the scientific approach so next week i'm looking forward very much to welcoming chris connolly dsnu who 
particular interest in science. And also um, joining Chris on the panel will be Tricia Robertson, who is one of the country's foremost psychical researchers. Uh, she's the immediate past president of the Scottish Society of Psychical Research, and she worked famously along Professor Archie Roy, uh, the Emeritus Professor at Glasgow University, um, and both have worked within this field of psychic research. So next week um, will be our last week for a few weeks, um, but we have two excellent guests, and I hope that you will be able to join us and bring your questions forward as we explore the bringing the scientific aspect of spiritualism to the fore. Thank you for joining us this evening, and I'm going to hand back to Al to close the evening. Thank you. Thank you, David. And I'd also like to add my thanks to Stella and Sue for a fascinating discussion that I think we've learnt so much this evening about an area of mediumship that we perhaps didn't know very much about some of us. And there's been some great feedback in the chat box, so I know it's really hit the right note with a lot of people. Thank you all for being here. It's been a great session. And as always, you being here helps to shape the direction of the discussion and we all get to find out things that we perhaps might not have thought of asking. So it's been a great group effort. So thanks for being part of this community and I look forward to seeing you again next week. And thanks once more to our guests, Stella and Sue. Thank you.